So this is just a quick recap of Lenin's reign to think about his role as leader and the qualities of leader um, and also the problems that there are in Russia that the next leader will inherit. So we're going to start with the October Revolution and move our way through towards uh, through Lenin's policies towards his death. So October 1917 then, the revolution happens. The Bolsheviks are inheriting a world war. Russia's in quite a poor state, so remember that they've already been in economic chaos. The provisional government started a June offensive, um, which started well and then ended up disastrously. And the German counterattack has left Russia in a really weak position. So Lenin, against the advice of his advisers, orders Trotsky to agree to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Now, this makes Russia look really weak. It leaves Russia with significant land loss where they could grow food and get resources from and also significant people loss. Now, Lenin has pushed this policy through and this shows us how forceful he is as a leader. OK, again, he's kind of pushed into holding an election for a constituent assembly because the people of Russia were kind of expecting the chance to vote on their next government. So the socialist revolutionaries win this and Lenin is clearly unhappy with this. So he declares democracy illegal, shuts down the constituent assembly and claims all power to the Soviets. So in theory, this is a really good thing because there's elected sailors, soldiers and workers. The reality of this, this is, is these can be dominated by his party. So we can see here a really forceful leader. Not everyone is happy with this. So the socialist revolutionaries clearly aren't happy. His political opposition clearly aren't happy because he's declaring democracy illegal. So in 1918, he is actually shot in an assassination attempt by a socialist revolutionary called Fania Kaplan. Now this bullet stays lodged in him and causes one of his strokes later on but it also leaves the Bolsheviks with a bit of a conundrum because a lot of people in Russia don't really know who Lenin is so they don't have that affection for their leader so there won't be the national outcry about somebody trying to assassinate him. So here's where we start to see a cult of Lenin to get people to idolise him and worship him um, as the founder of the revolution. So it's designed to get people to support him personally and get them behind the regime. We know the Tsars were able to do this by the divine right because they were chosen by God. So they naturally had that element of worship. And this cult of personality goes through for all leaders all the way up to 1991 when the Soviet Union falls. So still lots of opposition and obviously that means a civil war breaks out. So Lenin, to, in order to win the war, again, comes up with quite an unpopular communist policy, which is war communism. So the government is taking over the larger state industries first um, and then they take over the smaller industries. And money is worthless, so people are leaving factories. Um, there's fuel shortage, so the factories can't work. People are going to the countryside to try and get their food. So Lenin has to put a stop to this and he requires people to meet a grain quota, to work in certain places, they are unfree. They've got a work card and a ration card. Now, if you don't comply as peasants with your grain quota, then they send in the grain requisitioning squads to seize it. So peasants were beaten up, homes were burnt. There was mass famine as a result of this policy. So Lenin loses a phenomenal amount of support from the largest group of people in Russia, and he needs to do something about it. OK, so his Kronstadt sailors, who had originally supported him in the October Revolution, were now against him and rose up against him at the end of our civil war. And he's that worried by it that he sends in a phenomenal amount of the Red Army to deal with it. Again, the peasants in Tambov also rise up in a mass uprising against the regime. So these are both highlighting that popularity is still a major issue, despite the Bolsheviks, who are now the communists, winning the civil war. Another good example of Lenin's leadership then is what he does to resolve this. So he brings in the new economic policy. And that's really important because it's the idea that it's going to appease the peasants to stop them um, from rebelling. So the peasant is allowed now to make a profit and keep that profit. Profit. So they've got a quota of grain that they have to meet and then anything beyond that that they've met can then be sold by them and they can keep the profits. So the idea is that they would st restart the economy. So smaller businesses have been given back to their owners. So they're now producing things because the owners can make a profit. And the idea is that the peasants will use their profit money to then buy goods from these smaller factories. Now, it doesn't work as well as Lenin would hope, but it does resolve one of the issues and does keep people slightly happier, the peasants happier, with the Bolsheviks. This causes a split within his own party to those that really support the ideas of Karl Marx and communism, to those that think they're going to get there slightly better later on. So the left wing of the party the Trotskyites, people like Trotsky, do um, 
support the idea of state-owned industry and state-owned agriculture. So they want big collective farms so that they can control the food production. On the right of the party, the slightly more right wing, they believe that actually this new economic policy is important to get everybody back on side and that you will gradually and spontaneously move towards socialism and then communism, which is what the Bolsheviks are working for. So once everybody's kind of settled and happier. So this policy isn't a massive success. And uh, Trotsky calls this a scissor crisis, as it very much looks like a pair of scissors on a graph. Now, lots of peasants were able to grow their grain, which meant that there was lots of grain on the market to buy, which pushes the price down. So we can see a downward trend in grain prices. On the other hand, smaller factories were struggling to produce their goods. So there was far fewer of these so that the curb for the prices of these is going upwards. So they were actually quite high. So as peasants, you're going to have to sell a lot of grain to be able to afford these. So they just don't bother wanting to buy this stuff. And also, they're not really goods that these peasants want to buy either. So what happens is the peasants are going to be less likely to put in the effort to grow the grain. So this is what Trotsky calls a scissor crisis. And we see that the criticism, I suppose, is quite justified that it didn't work. But it did have the added benefit of obviously getting people back on side. So Lenin's health is now faltering. So after being shot in 1918, his health has declined. And in 1922, he undergoes surgery to remove the bullets because doctors believe this is causing his illness. His first stroke happens in 1922, and this leaves him paralysed down the left side and unable to speak. He does recover enough to return to government, but it's clear that by 1923, he's fearing the worst. So he starts to dictate his instructions for the party after his death, or if he's incapacitated. So the problem is that he's got a divided party. OK, so we need to think about who is going to replace Lenin and keep this revolution going. So Lenin comes up with something called his testament. But the problem he leaves is that his role in the party and in government wasn't particularly clear. So he keeps control really by his force of personality. Now, he was president of Sovnarkom. Sovnarkom is the body that runs the country. Um, but Lenin feels this is too big. Now, in our terms, we probably equate it to our cabinet. Um, and he obviously feels it's too big. So he ends up with an inner cabinet, which is the Politburo. Now, that is a group of seven to eight men, which he feels can make decisions much, much quicker. Um, and it's day to day running other countries. So it's a small group of men that are able to do him. People like Trotsky are on this cabinet. And these are the people that Lenin would envisage would take over after he dies. He's also, during, due to the Civil War, in charge of the Council of Labour and Defence. Um, and within the party, the two that are read there are within the party. He sets up the checker very early on in December 1917, the secret police, to ensure that his opposition is under control. He thinks that terror is a necessary evil, but he distances himself from it, from the concentration camps that have been set up, from the persecution of the church, from the persecution of their political rivals as well. So he doesn't publicly really want to be associated by it, but he recognises that it's important for the revolution. So he's quite firm on that. And the party obviously puts forward its representatives to a central committee who then supposedly are the highest decision making body of the party. And it meets a couple of times a year to decide upon policy. Really, what they do is they agree what the Politburo has put out. And obviously the Politburo, the party, he's kind of in control of the party as well. So he does a very, very job within the party. Um, but generally, he kind of keeps it all together and he's in control and they follow his direction. He allows people within his party to discuss um, and to kind of come up with and negotiate the ideas. However, once the policy is out there, he very firmly believes that they will have to stand behind that policy. So after he's incapacitated in 1922, they come up with this idea of having a general secretary of the party. Now, this general secretary most of the party members see as a bit beneath themselves. It seemed to be more of an admin role, seemed to be Lenin's mouthpiece as such, because obviously he's not in day to day control of the government. Now, Stalin sees this as a real opportunity and takes this role. Now, he is in charge of the membership of the party. So these people are people that are going to vote on policies in the Central Committee. Uh, the allocation of jobs. So again, he can make sure his loyal supporters go into these and the organisation of the party. So he's making himself look like he is actually one of Lenin's closest advisors and his natural successor. Um, so this is a really important position it ends up being. But actually, um, it wasn't seen to be that important by the Bolsheviks. They mistook 
uh, what it was all about. So Lenin decides that he needs to leave his testament. Okay, it's like a will, but it is his ideas about what how the party should carry forward and his kind of view on the party members. He's broken off relations with Stalin at this point because Stalin has been very rude to Lenin's wife. And Stalin only knows about this testament as he's told by some of the allies in Lenin's office. Now we will see the testament uh, by looking at it in the textbook. So Lenin is going to be a hard man to replace and he's got quite a forceful personality. He's held it all together. He's got a vision. He's got this idea of Leninism, which is working towards socialism. But he does understand the needs of the country. So he understands he needs to backtrack to maintain the revolution. So leaders are inheriting quite a lot of problems, but also they also need the skills that Lenin has to understand the situation.